Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, when I heard about this conference, I was really excited because it's been really hard for me to talk about anxiety before. Um, I once dated somebody that told me, don't tell anyone you have anxiety. You might lose funding for your startup. Uh, it was terrible because I just learned that I had to keep it very quiet. And now that it's kind of the norm that so many people have it, this is one of the most new opportunities, most important opportunities to be able to just talk about it and not have it be as difficult of a subject. And when I started to interview lots of different people, some of the highest performers, some of the people that I looked up to who I thought their lives were perfect, they had anxiety, they had depression, they had hidden demons. And so I was excited to look into that more. The last few years, I've been just trying to understand what is it about the state of technology today that causes or amplifies existing anxiety and depression that we might have, and how can we have some things that help ourselves while we wait for some of the technology and this kind of era of interruptive technology to calm down a little bit. So there are these quotes that usually happen at these big conferences, like 20 billion, 50 billion, all these billion devices will show up by 2020. And whenever these quotes happen, and when people are really excited about this, I, I like to ask whether this sounds good or not. The original promise of technology was to give us more time, not less, to make us more creative. But technology, like a gas, seems to expand to fill every available moment in our lives. It's like the new cigarettes. Don't have anything to do, dip into your phone for a minute. It's very hard to have time away from that because they're, they're with us all the time. So does it sound good when we have more and more tech and when at some point in the future we have enough tech and everything is solved? It's always a couple, like 10 years away. At some point we'll have so much tech that all of our problems will be solved. The only way to solve the problem is to add more tech. And I would say the only way to solve the problems is to add more human instead. So we have these different things like the smart watch where it, ha it just amplifies the amount of messages that you get on your phone. Sometimes this is useful because you don't have to dip into your phone and get distracted by something else. But then you have technology appearing in places like the smart fridge. Somebody tweeted at me yesterday that their fridge required them to accept terms of service to be able to use it. The fridge wouldn't work unless they accepted the terms of service. Or the idea that your fridge can be hacked and then be used as um, another piece of the greater surface area of attack for your house. And when you put all these things together, you get what I like to call the dystopian kitchen of the future, in which everything speaks a different programming language, is run by a different venture-backed startup that may or may not last for one or two years. If you're lucky, if you get divorced, you have to split up all the profiles, but they haven't supported that because these devices haven't been around long enough to deal with any human circumstance that they might uh, run into. And when you go home at night, instead of just being a human, which is what I want to do when I go home, I suddenly have to be a system administrator in my own home. And these devices are so chatty that when they talk to each other, they take up more bandwidth than Netflix, so I can't even stream Game of Thrones when I go home and try to relax. So we have this era of interruptive technology. It's not just battery life that's interruptive. It's not just the um, text messages and then push notifications that are interruptive. It's our own time and our anxious thoughts that start to get interu interruptive. And if you have anxiety like me, the first thing that hits me in the head in the morning is this cycle that just has this negative thought loop that I have to get out of. And so I have to go through this entire process to get my brain to a normal state. And if I touch my phone, it just amplifies it. But it's really hard because we fall asleep next to our phones, we wake up next to them, they inhibit melatonin production, uh, in our bodies through putting blue into our eyes, and we get in trouble because we have less sleep and we have less of that human time. So what's the opposite of that? I was doing my research on cell phones for my thesis in 2007, and I came across this concept of a calm technology. And this isn't new, this was from the 80s and 90s at Xerox PARC. And Xerox PARC Research Center, not only did they give us the Xerox copy machine, but they gave us graphic user interfaces, they gave us ethernet, they gave us a lot of understanding of human-centered design that we've brought into our world today. But the reason why Xerox Park was so useful and so um, really, it, it really could expand things for us was because people like Mark Weiser, John Seeley Brown, um, and all these artists uh, were in there, anthropologists, artists, were there to counter the technology. There's a, an often told story that isn't entirely true, but it's a good one, by an anthropologist, Lucy, uh, Lucy Suchman. So Lucy Suchman was hired to see 
why people didn't like the printers in their organization. And she found that people were keeping these very noisy copy print machines in just these extra like print closets inside their organization. And it was very upsetting to people because you'd have to be highly trained to use this machine. There were all these buttons. It was very upsetting. And she said, you know, most of the time, people don't want to do technology for technology's sake. Uh, unlike an engineer who built the machine that said, look, we want to have everybody be able to have access to all of these buttons. This is very exciting. But most people just want to do their job. So she said, well, just put a big green copy button and that will suffice. But it took one anthropologist to go in and say, what the general public needs to do with this machine is different from how people built it. And you have to have somebody in the middle. And so having these artists and anthropologists and researchers and all these different kinds of people, you know, and sometimes taking psychedelic drugs and sitting in beanbag chairs, like this was just trying to get people out of this very industrial idea that this is the world and this is how it should be. Because almost everything that we interact with now is made by a human, even, even nature is sculpted and manicured by humans if you, go to, um, if you go to a state park, for instance. And we have a choice over whether to build those things in a way that's interruptive or not. So this is Mark Weiser and John Seeley Brown. When I ran into Mark Weiser's work, I realized that he had passed away only a couple years before. And he was one of the people who predicted ubiquitous computing, the Internet of Things, that our world would be filled with pads, tabs, and boards, and that devices would one day outnumber people. And I think a couple years ago was the first time that devices outnumbered people. And he said, and he said that once this happens, we will have this new era in which many devices share each of us instead of we share, um, many of us share a single device, a single mainframe computer. And the most important thing was that Technology would no longer be scarce and expensive. The scarcest thing would be our attention. And how technology would make or break our attention would make or break those products. If you go to calmtech.com, I've actually just taken all of the early research papers. They're beautifully written. Um, they're very early. They talk about the technologist's responsibility in location tracking, 1989. Um, what about information that's shared? What about uh, political environments? What about you know, all of the different things that we're dealing with today, way before their time, they hold up right now. And then I got really upset that he died and I said, I just wanna bring forth a lot of his work in the era that he should have been a part of. So if the promise of technology was to make us more creative and to connect us and not divide us, how do we use technology to give us more time and not less? And how do we reorganize our relationship to technology to bring about this original promise? Uh, so in the present day, of course, we're waking up next to our phones, we're going to sleep next to our phones, we take care of our devices better than we take care of ourselves. How do we change the phone crying and picking it up and soothing it back to sleep and feeding it and plugging it into the wall at night and jumping if we get a phone call because we're terrified that it's an emergency? Um, this is the average number of times that we touch our phones per day. This isn't checking your phone. The average number is about 120 to 150, just checking your phone per day. But this is the amount of touches. If you're a heavy user, let's say you use Tinder, you're more likely to be in this range, the 5,000 level, because you're swiping and touching and tapping. And this is upsetting because, and this also includes like, you know, typing an email. But this wasn't there you know, all the way back in 2006 or before. Like, you had to be a business person to have a piece of technology that you would use this much and you were doing business, you know. Now, what is the difference between doing business for a social network that you're not even getting paid for and doing something that actually gives you some enrichment and, and it allows you to remember things? So when given the choice, people are going to take the easier path. People generally do take the easier path. You know, this is just a, a, a picture of who's taking the stairs versus who's taking the escalator. You, know, you see this in front of like, you know, nice fancy gyms. You see the people take an escalator to get to the gym instead of take the stairs to get to the gym. Um, but the idea is if, if we're always doing these things that are easier, like going on Facebook and sending a message instead of calling somebody up because that's much harder, or purposefully ending a relationship and telling somebody instead of ghosting them, or trying not to, you know, get all these expectations and then panic and then don't talk to people for two days and then don't tell them, you know. There's all these different things where we have these kind of unfinished situations that are going on all over the place and these kind of run on relationships, run on work, run on everything. 
Um, so I was really interested in looking at the system one and system two thinking, and my interpretation of it is different than, than how the, the standard is, but the minute I learned about this, I said, okay, when I wake up in the morning and I grab my phone, that's system one thinking. It's fast and automatic, and when I look at the text on the phone, it's emotional. If I can disrupt that and I can switch into system two thinking, and I can prevent myself from grabbing that phone and getting myself into an anxiety attack, and I can grab a notebook instead or wake up and make some coffee and stare out the window in the morning, I have succeeded for those hours in the morning. And I started to track my emotions over, over time. I noticed that if I was on my phone for more than four hours, I would just stay in bed and I would never get up. And if I was able to just change what I was doing just a little bit in the morning, I'd be more likely to go outside, walk around the block, have a run, go and do a to-do list instead of just sit there and not do anything all day and just read articles on the web and feel really bad. So if system one is what I was dealing with all the time, I was constantly in a state of panic. Oh no, and I'm not ever doing anything, and oh no, there's this article and there's this horrible social injustice and I have to tweet about it and I'm so mad and I can't do anything about it, and then there's this text message and it's unresolved and made me mad, but versus when you go and you walk in nature somewhere in front of a mountain or an ocean and suddenly you get this thing that's far larger than yourself and you have a perspective and you say, actually that doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't need to react that way. What am I doing? Like, what am I doing with my life right now? This is okay. When I touch this piece of news, am I going to remember it for five years? When I'm 80, am I going to say, this was something I remember about my life that was really important? I think there's a concept that I really like from the Greeks. There's two kinds of time. There's chronos time, which is the industrial time. It's the time where you schedule a thing to happen at 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Here's our agenda. It's the industrial time of predictability. It's you need to do the same thing again and again and again so that we can be consistent in our business. But that industrial time doesn't allow for the human creativity. It's not the time of staring at a sunset, falling in love, eating something interesting, going to a conference and accidentally meeting somebody in the hall and you end up doing a company with them two years later or you have a best friend for life. That's Kairos time. And Kairos time is this human time. Every time we get one of these text notifications and these things that take us out of human time, that's Kronos time. Every time we stop and we go over here and we sit and we settle and we think before we type, that's more of a Kairos time. So, how do we get some of that back? That's the innovative time. That's the time where we're just sitting and being with ourselves. That's the non-anxious time. Or in some cases, it's the anxious time where you get to know yourself after not knowing yourself for so many years because you've been just producing media for somebody else. So can we move our ideas of panic to a more perspective time? Can we disrupt the immediate process? And I think we can. I've been trying it every single day with some results because I'm dealing with having been on a computer since the age of three with an Atari, having wireless internet as an, as an early kid, and then also having, um, you know, growing up in a couple different smart homes and having a dad who like worked on AI who was an engineer and then having my mom like get replaced by technology when I was 10. I mean, there's all these strange things where it was just tech, 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 tech. So I've been kind of stuck in it for a really long time. And so I'm trying to think, is it possible for me? Is it possible for other people? A lot of what the Industrial Revolution gave us was instead of having these small communities where you are really associated with family and a lot of, of like ma and pa businesses and a lot of walkability, we started to have what Mark Auger calls non-places. In a non-place, you as a human are put on pause. You don't have any relation to anything, you don't have any history, you don't really have any identity. These are places of transition. These are liminal spaces. So these are, these are spaces like, um, like an airport where you don't have identity relation or history, or a traffic jam, or a waiting room, where you as a human are put on pause. Or when you're waiting for code to compile, or when you're waiting for a horrible form that's online that doesn't make any sense. Um, these are these non-human moments. And so what's happened is, once we had this mobile portable technology, that helped us be more, you know, feel more human in these moments. So now you see in airports, everybody has a phone and they're looking at it, because that has more identity relation and history than the place itself. And so it's really hard to connect in these places. And so people are, they're on pause, they're going to use this more. So it means that this is, is so much more capable instead of the landline phone that you could sit 
for hours and drawn little post-it notes and talked to your friend, instead of that being rooted to a single room, you're kind of catching a moment on this handset when you can, and you're not really having a deep conversation. Everything's become more shallow and a little bit more junk food, and these like just little moments to pass the time because the time around us has become so empty. So this kind of automatic phone checking happens and we start to get these crazy responses all the time and we're in this like state of anxiety and fear and then fundamentally regret. How many of you have binged on Reddit for two hours and then said, what am I doing with my life? I can't get that time back. And how many of you, 10 years ago, when somebody said binging, that was considered a bad word and now it's, oh, I just did a Netflix binge. How many of you have binged on Netflix for five episodes and not gone to the bathroom because there's no breaks. At least television, you sit away from the screen and you have a little bit of a break, but there's this thing where you just curl up into bed and your neck gets all crunched. And when you think about people thinking, their eyes often go up here, and that allows you to get different thoughts. And so when we're constantly crunched down, we're not getting any of these perspective thoughts and we're just stuck in this world that's you know 500 miles deep, but this large. And the problem is that real things take time. So when you look at people who have hobbies, they don't have to be the best at hobbies, but they have time to have hobbies. Like people who have little like model railway things in their basement, first off, who has basements anymore? And secondly, who has the amount of free time and a stable job so that at 5 p.m. they can come home and like build this giant landscape in their basement? I mean, you know, so how do we have hobbies again? The problem with a hobby is that you're constantly comparing yourself to every perfect person who's done things for longer than you and is better than you online. If you make necklaces, there's always somebody better than you on Etsy. If you beatbox, there's always, you know, Reggie Watts who's done stuff amazingly, you know, and if you do something else, it's, it's scary, right? But you have to allow yourself to go deep into something very, for a long time and be awkward and then suddenly you have something meaningful to the side and stop comparing. And a lot of people before radio could just play an instrument. Like people would come over to each other's houses without, without knocking in the neighborhood and they would play instruments with each other. Did they have to be good? No, they were having a good time. It's like kids on a playground. Are they any good? Who cares? They're having exercise, they don't know it. They're being creative. So now that we consume more that we create, it's much easier to feel like we're doing nothing and to have this regret. I started to just make music and take samples because I had really no meaning in my life. And it was really hard and impossible to be good at. And that's the joy of it. I started looking at people who have lots and lots of money and they don't have to work. And people will sometimes panic, but other times people will do art and culture. They will do the human things because they're unmasterable. So if we don't have the strength to automatically go to system two, or we can't really constantly expect these companies because it's not profitable yet to do this, to protect us, then, then how do we get back our attention? There's the time well spent movement, which is a, a great step in the right direction. Um, but I think just knowing a little bit about how it affects you is important. Like this quote really messed with me, I guess. Like the mere presence of a smartphone reduces brain power. I started this experiment where I would just put my phone face up on my bed and then I would leave the room, I'd go do other stuff. And then if I came back to my room, it was like the phone was a black hole, like I had to touch the phone. And I was thinking of doing something else, oh no, the phone is much more fun. Oh no, the phone is better, I have to touch the phone. You know, There's a history of addiction in my family, like I'm definitely going to touch the phone before I do anything else. So then I saw these videos of artists where they said, let's just take a heavy glass bowl and put it on top of the phone and put a bunch of books on top of it, and your phone is locked in this crazy assemblage. And then when you want to use your phone, you have to take all the books off and you have to take the glass pot off, but you can see that the phone's in there, you know? And so you see that you can't use it. Like these little tricks to just buy yourself some time because automatically it's just going to be taken up. It's too easy. So what I started to do is just put my phone on airplane mode by default and then turn off all the notifications. Like if we were to take five minutes right now and you were to go in your phones and just turn off all the notifications except for the really crucial ones, like I have crucial ones from WhatsApp, those are on, because I only have my mom in there, and maybe a few other people. But just doing that means that I'm not checking my phone constantly. How many notifications are you getting from humans, and how many are you getting from bots that are trying to get your attention from apps? Uninstall those apps or turn off the notifications, they're not crucial. I tell people to call me if it's an emergency. 
and people barely do, but when the phone rings, usually it's a robocall, so I can't even do that, so I just keep it off. Um, if you can spend an hour a day without your device, like just having it turned off in your pocket, I mean, there's, there's enough time if you turn off your device that it takes so long to turn it back on again, you're like, oh, I really don't want to turn it on. But if you can spend that hour and you say, even if you're sitting there for an hour and you're like, I hate my life, I hate myself, I don't like sitting here, I have nothing to do, you'll end up doing something, you'll fold your laundry or you'll like draw something, and you'll say, this is awful. But that hour of real human time that seems like it's forever is just a blink of time that you would have wasted on your phone anyway. So it's free time that you can just have. And I've been trying to do that every day. It's really hard to do but it's made a difference because then I'm like, okay, what did I really want to do today? And then when you do things, just do one thing at a time. Um, I like calling people instead of texting them. I, of course, ask first, can I call you? you know? And I have a very small group of people that love phone calls. Like I have a friend, uh, Chris, who calls me whenever she's on a tall hill. So I get a phone call, hi, I'm on a tall hill. Great, Chris, let's talk. <laughs> you know, and so she has this perspective when, you know, up on the hill, and then I can talk. And, and I think that's a neat thing because it's not, I'm calling you in between waiting for a bus and I'm angry because da 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 da. It's, I'm sitting here looking at something and I've walked and I, we're going to talk in human time. I have a friend, Mario, who just calls me like every two days about nothing. We don't talk about anything. It's just, ah, oh, what about, the, you know, for an hour. Those are my favorite moments. For a while, he would call me every morning, and he didn't know, but I couldn't get out of bed in the morning until he called. It was the only thing that was getting me up in the morning. So if you can expand your Kairos time instead of Kronos time, you can get to different things. You can, I don't know, I'm trying to do this. It's really hard. So how do you deal with the emotions? Then I was thinking, every time I'm on the computer or on my phone, I'm getting really triggered by all of these crazy texts that are happening, and especially on social networks. And instead of reacting immediately, I would just pause. Or I would write the entire you know, block text of, this is awful, da 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 da, and then I would copy and paste it into a document and save it, but I just wouldn't post it. And then I realized that social networks are profiting off of your misery. They can get you to be upset. If they can get you to be depressed, it's been proven that you will buy stuff for more, you will sell your stuff for less, and you will stay on the site longer and you'll react to more stuff. And so if it's a piece of fake news, especially, which is programmed to get you to be upset so that you will comment and make them money, how can you just stop and say, oh, this is making me upset. I should just not spread it. Can you do something instead in your community? You know, can you just organize something? Can you talk to people? It's like, I'm really upset about homeless people. Well, I'm gonna go down and, do I have time for that? If I don't have time for that, there's some problem in my life that I need to solve. If you have an hour for your phone, then you should have an hour to do something in the community at a human scale. And that's the problem. We used to have a lot more human scale time, and now we're at this industrial scale time. We're at the global level, and so it's almost impossible to actually do something at that small human level, but that's where a lot of meaning comes from. Um, there are a bunch of plugins for Chrome. This is my favorite one. It's Facebook Newsfeed Eradicator. I just install this and it gives you an inspirational quote instead of your newsfeed. That's it. So when I log into Facebook, I can get my messages, I can get my events, I can click on the side. I can even post, which I don't do very often, but I don't see the feed. <sighs> it's really nice. Um, that's helped me so much. So now my average time on Facebook has gone down by like 30 minutes a day which is good. It still makes Facebook money because I use Instagram, but you have to be good at what you do on Instagram to be followed, or at least you have to be aesthetically pleasing if you're an ad and be kind of clever. So there's at least more of a bar than just posting fake news and making people upset. Um, this is my other favorite thing. Every time I go into Gmail, it's like a, a, like a paleontology site where there's all this dust that constantly keeps going on top, and I'm looking for these bones and I have to dig for them and then halfway through digging for this old email, and what keyword was it? A bunch of other like cool bones show up, and I have to click on them and look at them because it's really exciting, and then I forget what I was doing, and 20 minutes later I haven't written the email, and I feel really bad, and then when I'm trying to go to sleep at midnight because I've been on my phone too long and I can't fall asleep because the blue light is inhibiting melatonin production, I remember the email that I didn't send, and I'm so upset with myself, and everything is horrible, and I'm a bad person, and I stay up for another two hours. So this prevents that. And I like it because you just click show inbox when you want to see it. You can compose an email and you can search. 
but you don't have to be inundated with something that you didn't sign up for when you log in. Um, this sleep cycle issue and circadian rhythm issue is a really big deal. Um, this, I was writing a, a piece on this on blue light. This spectrum of blue light, um, this high energy visible light, um, is something that, that got pioneered by like the blue LED and these screens that we have. They're emitting this kind of high energy dangerous light that is um, really bad actually for kids because their corneas aren't fully, um, I guess, installed <laughs> until they're like 14. And so if they're on a tablet and an iPad late at night, or you know, even in the day, all day long, that's actually leading to a lot of nearsightedness. This can lead to all the tired eyes, this can lead to you being more anxious, this can lead to you being more depressed if you're just staring at this. So I started installing Flux and all these other things. They're okay, but they change the color of the screen, which I don't like very much. Um, there are these kind of glasses, a lot of them are kind of nerdy. If companies start to make glasses that are a little bit better, you can actually look at some of the technology and go to an optometrist and get contact lenses and glasses that have natural blue light filters in. And like this, for the example um, of Beyond UV, it doesn't have any tint, so it doesn't even change the color. So if you're a graphic designer and you're on the screen all day, you can actually block this blue light and go to sleep properly at night instead of stay up all the time um, without changing the tint of the screen so you can still do your job. Uh, there's another company in Minnesota that's actually trying to get the actual glass of our displays to be embedded with this high energy visible light blockers. But the problem is a lot of our lights are being replaced by LEDs and a lot of city lights are being replaced by LEDs and those also emit these high energy uh, blue light and that's going to be really bad especially for people in impoverished areas that don't have the right blinds or they're working at the wrong shifts and they need to go to sleep at night and so the question is, can we get filters for those as well? We're changing the color temperature of our light from something that's human in the orange and red and yellow coziness into something that's hard-edged and industrial, and that's not who we are as humans. So we won't be able to be a cozy and sit with our thoughts and think as much, and a lot of people don't have access to nature and these natural lights, so they're just stuck in these poorly lit environments for their entire life. Sorry for the dystopia, but I really care about this. Um, and then this kind of junk sleep. It's a bunch of Singaporean uh, student researchers that came up with this term. Junk sleep is when you use your, your phone too late at night and you can't go to sleep and then you get a few REM cycles, then you wake up in the wrong REM cycle and then your, your software, I guess, just isn't cleaned enough when you wake up and then you just can't think as well. So if we have all this inhibition of melatonin, then the whole efficiency and life hacks that we're doing with our lives to like be more efficient are just gonna go out the window because we can't even take advantage of them. So I guess the idea is don't use your phone that much before you go to sleep, but I still use mine. I just wear those blue blocker glasses and I can fall asleep and it's better. Or do something that requires mental work, like a physical book, you have to sit there and imagine all of the characters in the book and your brain is just like, I'm so tired that you just pass out. Um, whenever I go to nature, things are larger than life and it's a lot more relaxing. It's just harder to get out there. Um, when I'm trying to do a talk or I'm trying to write or I'm trying to think about something, I'll just take a walk and that seems to, like right in the middle of it, I'll get the idea. But it's really hard to justify that if you work at a company. Hey, I'm working on this really hard software project. Can I take a walk? Can I get all of it in my head? Oh no, you need to have this meeting at this time in this standup where you have to be very industrial. And there's this kind of manager time, this kind of software developer time that are always at odds. I think we need to have rules in our society where at least after 5 p.m. you don't have to respond to something. Or you can say that you can have some time in the evening where you can just calm down and not have to use anything. Um, so one of the principles of calm technology from Mark Weiser is that technology shouldn't require all of our attention, only some of it and only when necessary. And I really like that. It's like the concept of a tea kettle. You set it, you forget it, go into another room and it shouts at you when, it, when it's done. But there's a lot of other technology that you can do with this, like you could have a light bulb that's attached to a weather report and it will glow the color of the weather that it's going to be. Instead of having this disembodied human voice telling you what the weather will be, it can just sit there and inform you quietly in the background. You don't need to pay attention to it. You can glance, get the information and glance back. It's not disrupting your life. How do we have technology that works alongside us and amplifies us instead of taking away from our attention? Um, so some thoughts on calm tech. It just works in your environment, but it doesn't work against you. 
it uses all of this peripheral attention that you have around you instead of this high resolution attention here so you can glance back and forth. It's not made up of blue light or all these crazy sounds and horrible frequencies that make you upset. And it's the simplest technology and nothing more. So it's more secure than really complicated technology. And finally, it's the least amount of tech to get the job done, which is hard to do. People keep adding tech on top. How can you take tech away until there's no, left to t no tech to take away? How do you make it so that every new feature is supportable and maintainable by the individual instead of having to send in a report? So I like this kind of right amount of tech as the minimum to solve the problem. If you can kind of, it's not that you should de-tech your life, but if you can just get better, slower tech in your life, things could be a little bit more improved. Um, these are some of my favorite technologies. The street light is just punctuation for roads. It's really straightforward. You glance up and glance down. It kind of goes into system one, but it goes calmly into system one instead of making you panic. And then the toilet occupied sign is a pictogram. There's no Bluetooth to figure out whether the toilet is occupied or not. It's just the one thing that doesn't really change on the plane. And I know these are really boring, but I would like to see more boring behind the scenes tech than the super aggressive tech that just makes you upset when you use it and it's really shiny and only lasts for two years. And finally, my favorite quote from Mark Weiser is that a person's primary task, as with Lucy Suchman, the anthropologist, and all these others, is that my primary task should be being human. Technology should be supportive of us, but not the main event. Unless you're building it and you're having a good time with it, that's a totally different thing. Um, but if we're human, and if when we're 80, we think about all these human moments that we had that were meaningful, I would say that's more of a success than having the regret about wasting time and not wanting to be on the web. It's fine if you're spending a half an hour, I can do whatever I want on the web, but I think a lot of us invariably just click on stuff and we don't really have a lot of control over it. Um, I wrote a whole book on how to design products to manage attention better, and then there's one on just sound, because sound is increasingly becoming an awful thing in our environments. Um, and then I made a website called Calm Tech that has all the original research. So hopefully this was reasonable. Thank you for being here. It's nice to talk about this for one of the first times. Thank you. Thank you so much.